Welcome everyone! Today's video is about JSON handling in Scala using the Cersei library. JSON is everywhere. It is probably the most widely used data exchange format in the world, which is why working with JSON is such an essential skill for most developers. But dealing with JSON in Scala can be a daunting task. But by the end of this video, my hope is that you will know everything you need to parse and manipulate JSON values in your apps. Let's see why working with JSON in Scala can be complex. You see, in many languages, specifically dynamically typed languages, transforming back and forth between values and their JSON representations is a straightforward process. Here's for example how it's done in JavaScript. But in Scala, things are a little bit different. The way Cersei and most JSON libraries work is a little more involved, but their approach also has great benefits. To understand why things work that way, let's ask ourselves this. What would it mean to encode a runtime exception into a JSON value? One could choose to encode only the message as a string, or they could also encode the whole stack trace, like this, or they could turn the error into a JSON object with several keys, one for the message and one for the stack trace, like this. These are all valid JSON values, and of course I've chosen runtime exception as an arbitrary example, but you get the idea. There is not one definitive way of encoding a given object into a valid JSON value. So I guess the thing to realize here is that serialization is an opinionated process. Since there are so many ways of turning values of a given type to JSON, we need some way to tell our JSON library how it should be done. Cersei does that using type classes. The encoder type class describes how a given type is to be transformed into JSON while the decoder type class describes how values of a given type should be built from JSON. Notice how encoders cannot fail. An encoder for some type T is supposed to turn any value of T into JSON. Decoders, on the other hand, will fail if the given input cannot be used to instantiate our type. Here's the full picture of how Cersei works. At the center of everything is io.cersei.json, an algebraic data type that is used to build syntax trees that can represent any valid JSON value. So it could be a JSON string, an array of strings, an array of objects, you get the ID. Suppose you want to convert back and forth between your serialized JSON objects and some author case class. Using io.cersei.parser, you can transform your serialized JSON into an abstract syntax tree. And then using a decoder, you can turn that into an instance of your author case class. Now, suppose you want to go the other way around. If you wanted to convert an author to a serialized JSON representation, you would first need to convert that author to a valid JSON value using an encoder. And finally, JSON values can be turned into strings using methods like spaces2, which will indent your JSON with two spaces. Similarly, there is spaces4, which will indent it with four spaces, and no spaces, which will give you a minified representation of your object. You can see from this diagram that the process of converting back and forth between Scala types and JSON values is distinct from the process of converting back and forth between these JSON values and their serialized representations. Let's see how this works in practice. So here we are looking at this build.sbt file and you can see that I have added several dependencies all related to the Cersei project. The Cersei library is divided in modules. Cersei core exposes the encoder and decoder type classes as well as the JSON structure we've been talking about and the cursors that allow you to traverse and modify JSON trees. Cersei generic allows to derive encoders and decoders automatically using macros. And then Cersei Parser allows you to parse serialized JSON into abstract syntax trees. And you will need all these dependencies to follow the rest of this tutorial. Let's talk about the JSON data type first. io.cersei.json is the type that represents any valid JSON value. The values of this type can be obtained using one of the available constructors on the JSON object. For example, if you want a string, you can do 
um, my uh, let's call it JSON string and then JSON dot from string and you pass it a scanner string and it gives you back a value of type JSON whose underlying representation is a scanner string. If you want to create a JSON number, you can do JSON number equals JSON dot from int and you pass it a Scala integer and it turns it into a value of type JSON. And then if you want to create something a little more complex, for example, an array, you can do JSON array equals JSON dot R for array and pass it all the values you want in your array, like this JSON string and this JSON number, and it creates a JSON array. Now this works, but it's a little bit verbose. So instead I will import io.cerc.syntax.underscore here and this import gives me access to a nice as json method. So let's use it right away. Instead of writing json.fromString, I'm going to write my string directly like this and then call as json on it and it will turn it into a json value. Similarly, I can write my integer and turning turn it into a JSON value by calling as JSON on it. And my array definition stays the same. So this is exactly the same thing. And when you call as JSON, uh, Cersei will use an implicit encoder to transform your value into a JSON value. So this is much nicer. JSON objects can be built using the json.obj constructor like so. So json obj equals um, json.obj and then you you pass the constructor key value pairs like this. So for example, uh, one could have a foo property like this whose value is bar. And don't forget to call as json on it because uh, the values in your key value pairs must be of type json. All right, so now we've seen how to build JSON values from scratch. Let's see how to manipulate those values. JSON values have various methods prefixed with map that allow you to transform them. And I'm going to showcase map string and map array, and I let you try the rest of them. Let's see how to turn this JSON string to uppercase. So you have to call map string and pass it a function from a string to a, a transform string like this. Uh, json string dot map string and then the function it expects is a function on the underlying string representation it will be applied on that scala string to create a new json value so then you can just create a function that takes the string and calls to uppercase on it um, by the way this is exactly the same as writing something like this the under uh, the underscore here serves as um, an anonymous parameter for your function. All right, so this is map string, and similarly, you can transform an array by applying a function on the underlying scalar vector. So if you want to turn every string in an array to uppercase, you can take that array. Um, in that case, this is JSON R, um, JSON array, sorry, and and then call map array on it. And you can see that it expects a function from a vector of JSON values to another vector of JSON values. I'm going to take that vector and map on it. And then for every JSON value, I'm going to call map string. And then it expects a function from a string to a, a new string. And I'm, I'm going to uh, take this string and call to uppercase on it. And you can see that the resulting array is an array whose first value is um, an uppercase string. And the second value, which wasn't a string, uh, has been left unchanged. Now, this is useful, but most of the time when manipulating JSON, you will be using cursors. Nested JSON values, they form a sort of tree. And cursors allow you to traverse that tree and update the content of any leaf. So cursors work like pointers to a particular JSON element that enables efficient update of the overall structure. So they're very similar to a computer science concept called a zipper. 
And to demonstrate how they work, I will create a slightly more complex object like this. I'm going to call it complex object. And this will be a JSON object with only one key. I'm going to call it nested and whose value will be um, our original object. So this is an object with one key whose value is a nested object. To obtain a cursor on this object, I will use the hCursor method. So this would be complex object dot hCursor. And then I can dive deeper by selecting a field on that object using dot down field and I will pass it the name of the field I want to focus, in that case, nested. Notice how my cursor type changes from an H cursor to an A cursor. This is because this particular field may not exist on our structure. So we need a special cursor that can encode the possibility of failure, so that when transforming arbitrary values, we can keep track of what went wrong. This is exactly what a cursor is. It's a cursor that allows you to focus elements on the structure and modify them, but also encodes the possibility of failure. Now let's go a little deeper and use the with focus method to transform the foo property on our nested object. So the first step is to uh, focus the nested property using, uh, sorry, using down field like this. So in that case, this is the property foo on the object nested. And then using with focus, you can pass it a function from a JSON value to another JSON value. And it will use that function to transform the value of the particular field that we are focusing. So in that case, what I want to do is take that foo string and transform it to uppercase because I have no inspiration. So. Uh, I will use map string like earlier and then um, pass a function that will be applied to the underlying uh, scala string like this. Um, actually, let's make it a little different. Let's reverse the string. All right, now I have a cursor on a transformed object, but this cursor is focusing a particular field uh, somewhere deep in the structure. So to get back to the top of my document, I will call the dot top method and it will give me back an option of JSON representing uh, the root of my document, of my transform document. And now you can see that the result of this overall expression is a sum of a JSON object uh, with one key nested, whose value is itself a JSON object with one key foo whose value has been reversed. And finally, I can turn this newly transformed object into a serialized JSON representation. So this is an option, so I need to call map on it to access the JSON value inside of it. And then on the JSON value, I can call dot spaces two, which will give me a pretty representation indented with two spaces. Spaces four will give me the same representation, but indented with four spaces, as you can see. And then no spaces will give me a minified representation like this. Now let's talk about encoders. You can see that I have two case classes. Uh, one author and one article and I also have instances of these classes and my goal is to write an encoder that I can turn values of type article into JSON. An encoder for some type T describes how values of type T are to be turned into JSON values. Encoders cannot fail and they can be defined simply as a function from T to JSON. So let's define one for author. I will create an implicit author encoder like this, whose type will be an encoder for the author type. And this encoder is going to be simply a function from a, an author to a JSON object. I'm sorry, I made a mistake right here, so I need a val keyword. And so it's a function from a, an author to a JSON object, and I will build an object with a 
name property whose value is going to be author.name.asjson and a bio property whose value is going to be author.bio.asjson. When you define an encoder for some type T, Cersei gives you encoders for option of T and list of T and more for free. And to prove that, I have summoned these instances and you can see that the code that previously failed to compile now compiles perfectly. Let me do the same for article. So an article encoder is going to be a value of type encoder for the article type defined as a function from an article to a JSON object and whose values are going to be ID this is going to be article.id.asjson title, this is going to be article.title.asjson content, which is going to be article.content.asjson and finally author, who's going to be article.author.asjson and don't forget the comma. Notice how I can write article.author.asjson and it will use the author encoder that I have just defined. With these newly defined encoders, I can turn my article into a nice JSON string quite easily, like this. Article.asjson.spaces2 And if I wanted to encode a list of articles, it would be just as easy. So let me create a list real quick. It will be uh, a list of five elements and then I can turn that list into JSON and turn that JSON into a string like this and it will give me uh, a JSON representation of an array containing five articles alright that was straightforward let's talk about decoders now Decoders are a little bit more involved, but hopefully not too much. So here I have my classes from earlier, author and article, as well as JSON values. And what I'd like to do is attempt to transform these values into instances of author and article case classes. One major difference between encoders and decoders is that while encoders cannot fail, their simple function from a type to a JSON value, decoders can fail and so there are some things that you need to know about how Cersei handles errors and we'll see them along the way. I will start by defining a decoder for author. I'm going to call it author decoder and this is going to be a value of type decoder for author, like this. When you have a case class or a tuple whose fields themselves have decoders, the easiest way to define a decoder is to use decoder.forProductN, where n is, th is the number of fields. In that case, this case class has two fields, so I'm going to use decoder.forProduct2. The forProduct2 method expects two parameter lists, and the first parameter list expects the names of the properties as they will appear on the object you wish to decode. So in that case, this is going to be name and bio. And the second parameter list expects a function that can build uh, your author instance out of two provided arguments, which is exactly what author.apply is. And the apply method is a method that you get for free on all case classes. Now, given this decoder, I can turn my valid author JSON into an instance of the author case class, like so. I will take the decoder and pass it my valid author dot h cursor, and it will give me back a decode result, which is just an either with a decoding failure on the left side and an author on the right side. And in that case, you can see that the decoding uh, was successful and I have a write containing a valid instance of the author case class. 
Another way to accomplish this is by calling the .as method on my JSON value directly and it will look at the appropriate decoder in the implicit scope. So what I can do is take my valid author2 and call as on it. You can see it expects a type parameter. I'm going to use the author type here and, it, and similarly to earlier it will give me back a decode result which again is just an either with a decode failure on the left. And you can see that in that case, uh, the decoding was, su was successful. And what it gives me back is a write containing a valid author instance. But there is more. Using the decode accumulating method on my decoder, I can get back not only the first decoding failure, but a list of many failures describing everything wrong with my JSON all at once. So if I take my author decoder and call decode accumulating on it and pass it a, an invalid author, like so, this gives me back a list of failures inside some invalid type. And you can see that in that case, this JSON object has no name field and the bio field is not a valid JSON string. This uses the validated structure from cats feel free to look that up. Now let's define a decoder for article. We've seen how decoder.forProductN works. Let's go for another approach here. I will create a function and in the body of that function use a for comprehension, decode every field one by one and then in the final yield build an instance of article. So this is going to look like this, an implicit article decoder, which is going to be a value of type decoder for article, defined as a function from a JSON to some for comprehension like this. In the body of the for comprehension, I will decode every field one by one like this, so what goes on the left hand side here is simply uh, an identifier that will allow me to build my article later. And what goes on the right hand side is a decode result. Uh, in that case, what I want to do is decode the ID field. And I'm going to do this by calling the get method on my JSON object. And you can see that the get method is one that expects, expects a type parameter A and it will attempt to decode a key on a JSON object and decode it to some A type uh, using an implicit decoder for, for A. So in that case, what I want to do is decode the ID key as a UUID. And I'm going to do uh, something very similar for all the fields. So I will decode the title field as a string like this the content field as a string as well and the author field of course as an author type like this and in the final yield i'm going to build an instance of article by simply using the all the fields i have properly decoded so id title content and author now let's use that decoder. If I take my decoder and apply it to some valid article like this, it gives me back a, uh, a write containing my article instance. So this is what I want. But now if I try to decode an invalid uh, object, uh, for example, if I try to pass it an invalid author, and decode it uh, using decode accumulating. Now you can see that it, it mostly works as intended, but we've lost the ability to accumulate errors. I should have multiple errors here and I only get one. So despite my JSON not looking remotely like a valid article, instead of getting back a list of multiple errors, I get back a list containing only one error. And this behavior makes sense if we consider the differences between monads, which is what we are using when we are using for comprehension to build our decoder, uh, 
versus applicative functors, which is what decoder.for product uses. Now, monads and applicative functors, they would require an entire video, so I'm not going to attempt a detailed explanation here, but for the purpose of this tutorial, remember this. Monads and applicative functors, they're both used to model effectful computations. And in that particular case, the effect I'm talking about is the ability to fail with a decoding failure. Applicative functors, they are used to aggregate independent or parallel computations, uh, which is why you can use them to accumulate failure. And monads, on the other hand, they describe a dependent computation where each operation can access the result of the previous one. So this is why monads can't accumulate errors, because to decode one field, you must have first decoded the previous one. And if for some reason you can't decode the first field, then you won't even attempt to decode the second, because it wouldn't make sense. Monads always return the first encountered error. We say that they are used to short circuit the computation. And when you use for comprehension to define your decoder, you are building a monadic decoder. Now, if you're more interested in the relationship between monads and applicative, I strongly recommend the video that Jakub Koslowski made about the parallel type class in CATS, which explains pretty well why some types ca can accumulate errors and some can't. Keep in mind there is a trade-off between the ability to model complex relationships between fields and the ability to accumulate errors. So using a monadic decoder, you can express things like this JSON is valid only if that field has this particular re relationship with this previously decoded field. And you can also have computed fields depending on the value of a previous field, like an ID field computed from the title field uh, let me illustrate this. So instead of decoding the ID field from the JSON input, I'm going to first decode the title field and then my ID is simply going to be built deterministically from my title field uh, using name UUID from bytes, like this. This is an example of how a monadic decoder enables a field to depend on the value of a previously decoded field. But we don't really need this, so let's go back to an applicative-based decoder, uh, so we can get our uh, error accumulation back. And this is it, I have a decoder for my article case class that can also properly accumulate failure. Uh, you can see that now, when I try to decode this invalid author JSON, I get a list of four failures, describing everything wrong with my JSON all at once. So errors on the ID field, the title field, the content field, and the author field. Finally, let's use the parser to build an article from a serialized JSON object. So I will turn my article into a string, and then use that as the input to the parser to demonstrate how it works. So JSON string is going to be a valid article that no spaces, and then the first step is to use io.cerc.parser.pass to turn that string into a JSON value. Like this, I will give it my JSON string. This will give me back an either, which could be a passing failure on the left side or a valid JSON on the right side, and in that case you can see that it gave me back a write containing a JSON object. And then I will use flat map on this and turn that JSON into an article. So flat map, and I take my JSON and I call as on it and I turn it into an article. And what it gives me back is an either with an either an error on the left or an article on the right. And you can see that in that case, everything went fine. And I have a write containing a valid instance of my article. 
built from a JSON, uh, from a serialized JSON object. So this is pretty much everything you need to know about decoders. Remember this, you are free to implement any extraction or validation logic. So your JSON object, your input, doesn't have to match your target type one-to-one. -one. It's really up to you. And if you use the monadic approach, that is, if you use flat map or four comprehensions to build your decoders, then you get the ability to model complex relationships between decoded fields, whereas if you go with the applicative approach, you lose that ability, but you get error accumulation for free. So it all depends uh, what you're trying to achieve. Decoders and encoders, they're great and all, but they require a lot of boilerplate to get things done. So what if I told you there was a way to get encoders and decoders for free without writing them manually? So these are our case classes from earlier, and you can see that all the lines below don't compile yet. These lines are requesting encoders and decoders uh, for author and article from the implicit scope and of course these don't exist because we haven't defined them but watch what happens as I add this import I am going to import underscore. suddenly my program compiles and my author in is turned into a valid JSON object which is crazy right? So when we add this import, Cersei is deriving for us encoders and decoders for any case class whose fields also have encoders and decoders. And it works with nested case classes too, which is why the compiler no longer complains about article either. Now automatic derivation seems great, but it has a somewhat magical feeling to it. And it requires you to import underscore at call site every time you need an encoder. But there is a way of defining encoders and decoders that is just as convenient, but feels less magical compared to automatic derivation. Let's talk about that. So like automatic derivation, Semi-automatic derivation uses macros to provide you with encoders and decoders for your types without the drag of writing them manually. But instead of having a single import that magically provides encoders and decoders for anything and everything, semi-automatic derivation requires you to ask for codecs explicitly for every type you want to work with. So this gives you more control over your serialization and remove the need to import io.cersei.generate.auto everywhere. The first thing I'm going to do is import io.cersei.generate.semi-auto. And then if I want a decoder for user, I can request it explicitly. So I can write implicit val user decoder, which is going to be, of course, a decoder of user. And its value is going to be derive decoder for the user type. So this gives me the exact same decoder that automatic derivation would have given me, but I have to uh, request it explicitly. And similarly, if I want an encoder, I have to write user encoder like this, and this is going to be derive encoder for user. And then for many types, you are going to want uh, bidirectional serialization, so both the encoder and the decoder. And this can be done in a single step by requesting a codec. So user codec is a codec of user defined as derived codec. And a codec is simply the combination of an encoder and a decoder in a single structure. And then given that codec, I can turn a user into a serialized JSON object easily. So I will take that user, call as JSON on it, then call no spaces, and it will give me back a minified JSON object representing my user. 
I would like to conclude this video by demonstrating why you should always prefer semi-automatic derivation to automatic derivation. So, with automatic derivation, any custom-built codec can be silently forgotten as automatic derivation will automatically compensate for missing codecs for us. Let's see an example of this. Consider the following case classes. We have a YouTube video type, which is a simple wrapper around a video ID, and then a user type, which has a name and an optional favorite YouTube video. What I'm trying to achieve is simply to serialize a user to a JSON object, but I don't want my JSON representation to match my types exactly. Instead, I want my encoder for YouTube video to be a little smart and build a complete YouTube URL using the video's ID. So I have this separate file and I'm going to define an implicit um, video encoder, which is going to be an encoder of YouTube videos. And this encoder is simply going to take the video and return a JSON string and build a complete YouTube URL. So this is going to be HTTPS, youtube.com slash watch and then a query parameter and this query parameter is going to be our video ID. So this is our encoder. Now let's showcase a very simple application that will print a serialized user to the standard output. So this is what the application looks like and when we try to run it, it compiles fine but it doesn't behave like we want it to. You can see that instead of getting a full YouTube URL, I get an object with an ID key uh, whose value is simply our uh, YouTube ID. And this is because I haven't imported my custom encoder. And if I add this line to the file, import JSON codex on the score and try to run the program again, it now works as intended. So you can see that uh, the user's favorite video is now simply a string containing a full YouTube URL. So this is the type of silly mistakes that could easily be avoided by the compiler. So what I would like is for the compiler to tell me that I have forgotten an encoder here instead of silently producing one for me. But this is the thing about automatic derivation it will do its best to make your code compile, which is convenient, but it makes it easier to forget something and end up with the wrong behavior at runtime, even though your program compiles. So if I had used semi-automatic derivation instead, it would have been immediately clear that an import was missing because the compiler would have complained. So I hope this clarifies why I think it's best to use semi-automatic derivation uh, instead of automatic derivation. And I think we have covered pretty much everything you need to know to use Cersei in your project. I hope you have enjoyed the video and I'd like to make another one about making a real world project using Cersei and other libraries of the type level ecosystem. But until then, take care and see you later.